who put it in print first is a really small question um, because you don't put things in print until it's already in oral circulation. And so uh, to, to clarify before we get going, this is what, if you look in a dictionary, it's sometimes termed the sort of first attested use, uh, right? So this is just where do we see it in, in absolute incontrovertible ways um, in print, and we're not relying on oral history. We're not relying on hearsay. We just point to it and say, "This is it. This is at. This is the. This is the terminus um, postquem. The sort of the date after which this word is definitely in use." Um, so, so this is not about the invention of the term furry. There are a ton of different words and phrases and ways to describe the community, to describe who we are, to describe the experience. Um, this just happens to be the one that won in the end, um, and for a variety of reasons. Um, so, um, uh, really what, what I want to focus on is talking a little bit about how do you do this work and what makes this so hard. Um, when, you're, when you're first trying to track down a, a piece of archival research, um, often a good place to start is just the most general kind of big scope thing that you can find. Um, and a really good resource for that is Joe Strike's Furry Nation. Um, uh, Joe Strike's Furry Planet, it's, oh, uh, uh, it might still be 99 cents on Kindle, FYI. Um, uh, there's like a, a quick sale that was happening, but um, totally worth it. Um, so Joe Strike's Furry Nation is great for giving you an overview of a ton of background about the furry community, about the furry experience. There are a lot of uh, interviews that he did. Um, and in this, I'm gonna go ahead and just read what he says. Um, so I, this is this is just stop number one. And he says, um, you know, Mark and Rod, uh, Mark Willino and Rod O'Reilly. Rod is over there. I'm very sorry that they scheduled him at the same exact time as, as us. Um, kept it up, hosting funny animal themed parties at other conventions the following months. They attracted more fans, almost all of whom had never dreamed others were into the things they were into. Tale as old as um, <laughs> uh, my friend Sam Becker. Um, when it was time for the next Westercon, uh, which is a convention that occurs on the, on the West Coast, uh, Mark and Rod decided to call their party by a different name. The 1986 iteration would officially be known as a furry party. Okay, so here's here's a point when we know at, at 1986 in Westercon in July that word is in use. And we're, I'm gonna show you some evidence of that uh, later. Why furry? What was wrong with funny animals, which was the most common term in use um, prior to furry sort of taking over. And it, it means a whole bunch of different things. For one thing, not all of them were funny. Irma, Irma Felna, um, Steve Galacci's uh, Albedo um, uh, is, is the character. Case in point, adjectives had been floating around fluffy and fuzzy among them. We could have been fluffies. We could have been fuzzies. <laughs> um, Mark credits a former Skilltare resident and self-proclaimed non-furry known as Dr. Pepper, no relation to the soft drink, for pouncing on the adjective. Meanwhile, an Australian fur and an American one who are friends have each told me the other first used furry in a 1983 fanzine, okay? So when you're trying to track down the earliest instance, you try to find the oldest reference that you can find and then track that thing down. The trick is, Joe doesn't say which fanzine it is, okay? So you either have to email Joe, he's very nice and he'll respond, um, uh, and he may or may not remember, he may or may not have it in his notes, um, or you just have to go and do a ton of other furry history until you can find other references to this that uh, that are the places where Joe found the reference. Um, so this is issue 34 of, uh, of a fanzine called Yarf um, that ran for 69 issues total. Um, and in this, this is a series of book reviews slash fanzine reviews that Fred Patton wrote. Fred Patton was the preeminent furry historian uh, um, and uh, he died um, about 10 years ago now, nine years ago. Um, uh, so in, in his sort of survey of things, he's, he gives a review of a couple of different fanzines. One of them is a fanzine called File 770, um, which is still in circulation today. And it's a sci-fi fantasy fanzine um, uh, 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 edited by a guy named Mike Glyer. Um, he's, a, he's a nice guy on Blue Sky. Um, and then later on, um, uh, Patton talks a little bit about some different uh, fanzines that he's already seen. He's seen at the same time. Um, and one of those is a fanzine called Phlogiston. You're not going to be able to read this, but I'll give you some stuff. Um, so uh, uh, Patton says, you know, there are these two great articles in Phlogiston 40 and 41. 
Um, and they're by uh, Jefferson Swigafer, Craig Hilton, and there's a lot of cool information. Craig Hilton, the Australian, is especially kind of interesting because he gives this 12-page sort of masterful uh, short summary of the history of furry. Um, and uh, he says, uh, bah, 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 um, uh, where did he go? Sorry. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, he, he says um, that one of the sort of one of the big deals about this, uh, it's, it's the blurry part. Um, so one of the things that he says is, um, this is great. He doesn't know about furry parties, really. So he misses that part of the history. But he has information that I didn't have access to. And that is that there were these essays that were published earlier in a British fanzine called Seek Biscuit Disintegraph. Um, and so you find you find the reference to what it actually is. Um, these are reprinted in South Furlands, and you can all go ahead and read these. Um, uh, one of them, Craig Hilton's overview of stuff, is uh, in South Furlands number two. This is a relatively old fanzine. It's an Australian fanzine, so you might despair that you'll get, be able to get access to it. Um, but uh, South Furlands um, is uh, partially archived online. And if you just go to the Wikifer page and then follow the link, sometimes the website is up and sometimes it isn't, um, but archive.org has saved good snapshots of it. Um, so you can, you can get it through there. Um, and you can read uh, in South Furlands number two, this is his discussion. Um, and Craig Hilton says, Joy Hibbert's sturdy gen zine, Seek Biscuit Disintegraph. It's really bad Latin for that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, uh, number four, 1983 from Great Britain of all places was where I first learned of furry fandom. The issue contained an article by a correspondent from San Diego, California with the unlikely name of Jefferson P. Swikaffer who was discussing the Freudian sexual underpinnings of something he referred to as furry fandom. Oh, okay. Well, Hilton says that this is the issue where a dude says in 1983, in November 4th, 1983, says furry fandom, right? Um, uh, the trick is, um, so uh, Patton, Patton is a subscriber to South Furlands. He reads this um, and he writes a reply where he says, you know, I'm kind of surprised. I wouldn't have expected that it would be that far back. Um, but um, he says, I wouldn't have thought that the actual term furry fandom was in use that early. But if Jeff Swikaffer was referring to it by that name in a fanzine in 1983, I guess it must have been, right? So Fred Patton did not have access to the fanzine himself. And he just said, yeah, that's cool. I had no idea. Too bad we don't have access to that broadly. Um, and this is the this is the fanzine. Um, so my copy came from there. Uh, uh, each issue of this had twenty to forty copies produced, um, and they were produced by Mimeograph, and then they were mailed out to people. My copy came from a sci-fi poetry author named Sam Sneed, who died a few years ago, and I managed to snag his collection of stuff. Um, uh, and what's really neat about being able to see this is that Swikaffer doesn't use the word furry fandom. He doesn't use the word furry at all. He calls it the fuzzy animal fandom. <laughs> so blah, 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 anti-technology, blah. Um, fuzzy animal fandom is given a favorable climate in which to evolve. He's talking about um, everybody's horny for animals. And so they're <laughs> horny for that, right? So he doesn't say furry fandom, right? Craig Hilton misrepresents this, misrep misremembers this. Um, and then Patton just takes it because that's what he's been told. That's what he has read. Patton flips out um, because Patton finds out later uh, that, um, that that's not true. He doesn't get a copy of this, but he talks to somebody who has a copy. Um, and he talks also to Swikaffer. And Swikaffer's like, I never actually used that term. And it was actually Craig Hilton that invented that term. Um, and so there's this game of telephone back and forth. Patton calls up um, uh, Mark Berlino and Robert Riley and is like, do you know where this first came from? Um, and Mark was just like, I don't know, sometime, like in the 80s, some shit like that. But I don't remember. I have no idea when exactly that happened. Um, right, so um, we sort of uh, fast forward. And um, unfortunately, Craig, Craig, Hilton, uh, uh, Craig Hilton's article um, is that's, that Swikaffer claims to have been the first instance in print um, is called A Zoophile's View, um, Furry Animal Fandom. Um, this is a good instance of words changing meaning and words baggage shifting in and out, right? 
if if you all said I'm going to a zoophile convention, <laughs> right? That's going to mean something very different from I'm going to a furry. I mean, maybe for a lot of people, it's not going to mean anything different, right? But uh, but it does, right? Um, and uh, uh, Hilton says Hilton Hilton publishes in this article that he talks of the fuzzy animal fandom, but he would prefer to call it the furry animal fandom. So Swykaffer says, oh yeah, you know, Hilton published this. It wasn't me. It was, it was him first. I was saying fuzzy animal, right? But here's the tricky part. Hilton says that this article, which was reprinted in South Furlands number seven, um, is, was submitted to Sick Biscuit Disintegraph around 1984, but was not printed, right? So he mailed it, but it wasn't printed. Do, can we count that as a first instance of a thing? Can I say, oh yeah, I wrote Furry back in 1969, but then it never actually got accepted and printed until 1999, but I still win, right? That's a, tr that's a tricky thing. The answer is no, right? It, no. it was not published. And a really interesting, um, oh, I, I didn't put this in, really interesting thing, Sick Biscuit Disintegroff, every single issue has at the front of it a set of apologies that the editor makes to the people who didn't get printed in that issue. And um, Craig Hilton's name does not appear in Seek Biscuit Disintegraph number five, right? So um, maybe, he for, maybe he forgot to send it. Maybe he thought he mailed it. Maybe it got lost in the mail. Um, we can't say anything about intentionality. We can't, I, I'm not in Craig Hilton's head and I wasn't there at the time, right? None of us were. So the best that we can say is that that didn't happen, right? It was not actually, it's not actually printed, right? So something that Fred Patton talks about in the YARF review is that he was kind of surprised to see it in fanzines because he thought for sure that furry really came from these parties that Mark Molino and Rod O'Reilly were establishing in California. Um, oh, so they talked about they actually, just, yeah, someone we just, actually yeah. asked the question, when did furry first come up in the panel with Rod O'Reilly? Yeah. <laughs> like right before you guys started, yep. he was talking about the parties in the mid 80s. Yep, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. right, so here, if you go to conference.com, um, uh, Mark Molino, Rod O'Reilly um, are, are phenomenal hoarders in the best of all possible senses, and they saved so much material from that time. Um, and Changa Husky, their partner, uh, also digitized a bunch of stuff and put it up here. Um, Conference.com, these are the two earliest instances that they have of the word furry in print. And these are room party posters for the furry party from Westercon 1987, July 1987. These are both dated, so Cy did the art for this one, July 1987, the same month as the Westercon convention. Um, Cy dated this one, it's April 1987, so he did this in the lead up to it, right? But a kind of interesting thing is, we're one year old, so there is at least one other instance before this, but they don't have a copy of room posters, they don't have anything that has that there, right? So as far as conference is concerned, this is the earliest instance of it. Um, uh, Westercon um, is fascinating for a lot of reasons, um, and Westercon 40, uh, which is sometimes referred to as Halleycon because of its coincidence with Halley's Comet, um, uh, is, a, is a kind of really cool event, and it was the place where the first furry parties um, uh, took place, and you can't see it, sorry, it's very fuzzy. Um, there is a reference in the con book for Westercon 40 in 1987 to this furry party, okay? This must have been printed long before the, par the posters were put up. So, um, hidden in the shadows of fandom is a group known as Furverts, or Funny Animal Fandom. The furry party has become something of a West Coast tradition and will be making an appearance at Westercon 40. Bring your sketchbooks and private stock and share with everyone else. Don't hold back now. The party will be held immediately after the masquerade at a location to be posted. There will be music, video stuff, and munchies. Stop by and see what you're missing, right? So this is the first instance in print of something that's published, uh, of a thing that was published as part of this convention. Um, uh, but there was, we know because of the posters, there was a furry party at Westercon 39 the year before this in 1986. Um, I cannot find any evidence of the word furry being printed anywhere for this Westercon. Um, there's a lot of really interesting information I picked up again. Um, we're, we're in the era of um, first generation furries are, um, are starting to die off, are starting to retire. 
Um, and so a lot of times when we find stuff, it's because it's because they've died. Um, this is from a sci-fi collection, a collection of a sci-fi bookseller who used to go to many of the conventions um, out on the West Coast. Um, and uh, Westcon 39 is really cool because this is where the first furry party is. I don't have evidence of the word furry being used here, but um, the, the program participants index um, uh, commemorates one of the panels that was present there. And it's a panel whose topic is sex with aliens, <laughs> but also things that are alien adjacent like anthropomorphic animals, um, right? So we can all see, you know, there's a, there's a sexy giraffe up there. We've got some dragons. Um, we've got uh, we've got some deer, so there's furry stuff going. Um, this was a panel that was co-run by three people. Um, Mark Merlino uh, was one of them, um, and Martine um, Barnes was another. She was a sci-fi author who has died. And the last one is a woman named Mary Mason. She's the last surviving person from this panel, um, and I'm hoping to chat with her sometime soon. So, um, so there's cool furry stuff happening. But I did manage to get. Uh, a copy of a bunch of material from Westercon um, 38. Westercon 38 is the year before the first furry party, the first party that had the name furry party, okay? Um, but um, Westercon 38 did have an open call for people who were putting on parties. And in their first bulletin, so this is July 4th, 1985, the first bulletin asks for people um, who are having a party to stop by the publications department in the American River Room and give us the details. This was from an era of printing out daily updates about, about parties that are happening at the convention and letting people pick them up. And this is, I am pretty sure, or at least to the best of my ability, the first instance in print of the word furry. It is the publication that came out, the bulletin that came out the day after this. Okay, so this is July 5th, 1985, and it's a bulletin advertising one of these parties. The Prancing Skill Tear Party, Chirp, that's the one, if you were in, uh, if you were in um, Vincent's uh, panel, that's the one he's referring to there. Um, hosted by CF Orange, so the cartoon fantasy organization um, uh, that did uh, anime, um, will kick off at 9 p.m. in room 675, third floor Sutter Wing, open to all fans of Japan animation, furry fandom, and other sons. Other sons is a TTRPG that um, Mark Merlino did art for. Um, so so this, this is the first instance. It is incredibly difficult to track this down because of inconsistencies in records, because of faulty memory, because of memory from 40 years ago, um, and from just access. Getting access to this material is impossibly difficult. And it requires a lot of blind faith. And honestly, it just requires a lot of money. Um, uh, I, I bought a, this collection. Um, uh, it was, it was pretty cheap. It was, it was 150 bucks. Uh, and I got a huge box of Westercon stuff, hoping, hoping, hoping that something, I was so hoping that there'd be some furry party posters in there and it would have been the jackpot. Um, but what was in there was also really cool. It was one of these bulletins and a bunch of other material from that, right? It's blind luck, blind luck to be able to find that because one bookseller who went to this convention happened to hoard things with his wife and died relatively recently. So, okay, I'll stop and give you this. Okay. So, uh, kind of, kind of connected to the history of when does furry first appear? Something I've been writing about and actually just published an article on on our website recently is on the origin of fursonas. Uh, it is a really fascinating question to me, in part because the first time that we see the word fursona that I've been able to track so far is 1994 on a Usenet post. Does anybody know what Usenet is or what it was? Yeah. Anybody yeah. use it back in the day? That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so Usenet was a, a basically a computer-to-computer -computer network. It's a sort of early listser, you could say. Uh, it's a way of uh, contacting a, a group of individuals who are interested in something, uh, and everybody who posts, uh, like everybody in that group can can see subsequent posts, and you can see the history, too, so you can see when posts are replied to other posts. Uh, basically just an early listserv that was common throughout the 1980s. Um, so 1994 in alt.fan.furry, which is kind of the biggest furry Usenet group, is, is, where I, is where we find a reference to the word fursona. I'll get to that in a little bit, though, because that raised the first problem with my research, which is, well, furry's been around longer than 1994, so what about fursonas? When have we had embodied animal selves? Um, should we... 
start this history at the first mention of personas, or should we start this history earlier? And if so, when is it that people start identifying with or as animal selves? That turns out to be a much more murky question, but in lots of cool and interesting ways. So one of the big historical problems here is what exactly is a persona? This is one of the problems that I had to sort of think about when I was writing this history article. Um, a persona is an embodied animal self. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary added furry and persona to their words we're watching list in 2016, and they have since been added to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and they define a persona as, well, a few different things. It can be a furry avatar, it can be an alternate persona, it can be a role-playing character, it can be somebody you, you cosplay online. It's sort of a, a collection of different things. And if we really take a step back, a persona can be quite a lot more. A persona is the things we are interested in that we can't necessarily bring to life, but that we think about. It might be the, the clothes that we put on. It might be the gear that we uh, incorporate into ourselves. Um, it might be the group that we surround ourselves with. It might be more than just the self that we create. It might be multiple selves. It might be dozens of selves. Some of us have many more than just one persona. So when you start thinking about what the limits of persona can be, it gets Again, murky, but I think in a really interesting way. And uh, a, a kind of corollary problem here is that um, furries have have not been very good at keeping to strict definitions throughout time. So what exactly a persona is, is not ter terribly clear in the historical archive, which I'll get to in a second. But I, I think that's part of furries' power, is that we, we, we actually don't stick to one definition of things. We sort of bend the rules and push against the boundaries and, and explore different selves. And I think that's that's kind of what's really cool about what we do in this fandom. So a question I had to think about was, well, if we're thinking about the er the origin of the persona, then what is the line between depicting a furry character and, and a persona, somebody that we on some level identify as? And it gets complicated when we look back at different historical sources. Uh, that Westercon poster is really fascinating because we see what appear to be furry selves in the audience watching a panel. So are those furry selves personas in the sense that they seem to represent the participants of WesterCon? Uh, an argument could, could be made that that's a, a kind of fursona. It's a, it's, an, it's a representation of the audience. Um, Terry Zwagoff, editor of the Funny Aminals anthology, comics anthology from 1972, summons, quote, my animal body in the foreword and TFs into a, into a bunny. Um, maybe that's a persona, but maybe not. I mean, it's, it's sort of a one-off thing. It's not like a, an ongoing identification, but it's an animal body and it's my animal body. So it's sort of a tricky case. Um, Rauer Brazel 10, uh, contributor to Rauer Brazel 10, James Badcock, thinks about bugs. Speaking of bugs, this happens to be the subject matter of my other cartoon strip. Why? I'll tell you, I've always wondered what it would be like to live in the insect world and how we humans differ from them. And sometimes I don't think there's much difference besides the size factor or that they have two to six more arms than us and about their table manners. Oh, so barbaric at times, don't you agree? Now I ask you, who was I speaking of? Bugs or people? Sometimes I can't tell the difference, neither. Think about it. So James Badcock wants us to think about the line between human and animal and animal identification. And what if that line is already invisible? I learned in researching this article that in the 1980s, it was also not uncommon to sort of adopt a furry character and in some way make them one's own. So Irma Felna, uh, who talked to us talking about a little bit earlier, um, as depicted on Albedo Anthropomorphics number eight, um, I, I heard in some of my interviews that in the 80s, some folks would would sort of cosplay as Irma Felna and, and in some cases, like make that character their own. So it was like basically Irma, but but shifted. It had a little bit of self personality built in. Another tricky case is that a persona or is it not? It's a character. It's a it's derived from a piece of media, but somebody made it their own. Um, the, these sorts of problems are why this was super fun and interesting to research because it was hard to tell what exactly is and what isn't a persona and and i i, I think that's kind of cool so right 
what's the line between depicting a furry character and having a sona? Uh, so then, who is the originator of the fursona? Does anyone have a, a thought on this? If we had to pin it down? If we had to name a name? I would think it would be those two founders of the furry community because they, yeah. I watched the furry down the rabbit hole like uh, documentary. Yep. And they they did talk like the the two uh, gentlemen did talk about like their characters and like how yeah. they and they they showed some of the early eighty first eighties fursuits on there. So yeah, I would think maybe maybe they had some semblance, maybe not the exact word, but maybe some semblance of it. Absolutely right. Yeah. So Rod O'Reilly and Mark Merlino were really instrumental in. Names. Yeah. No worries. No worries. Um. They, they they were part of what sort of became the blossoming of different furry characters into this nascent furry world. So they were super crucial to it. Another name, you, you mentioned the fandom, um, the, the documentary that came out in 2020, which which a lot of you might have seen. If you haven't, go check it out. It's really good. It's on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. It's on YouTube. Um, the fandom names the one and only Ken Cougar as the founder of Fursonas. And that's right. Ken Cougar is the founder of Personas. It's complicated. For the reasons I said before, where do we draw the line between a persona and something else? Um, some of the some of the sort of case studies I was showing you earlier predate Ken Samples artwork. And so if you consider those to be personas, then I guess there's something like a persona that predates uh, Ken's artwork. But what Ken did that nobody was doing before was that Ken depicted himself and his friends as furry avatars, as furry characters, which is something that was not happening. And when Ken started doing it, everybody else followed. And this is all within the context of this emerging furry fandom. So when one artist starts to depict oneself as an animal character, others are like, cool, can you do that for me? I, I, I would totally love to see myself as an animal too. What do you think I am? What species am I? What kind of markings do I have? What color am I? Um, so Ken, Ken Cougar really sort of started things off. Um, so as I say, uh, Ken is mentioned in the Phantom documentary. I had the absolutely incredible and rare opportunity to um, chat a little bit with Ken as I was writing this article. Uh, that was a very special honor. And I, I learned something, which is that Ken said to me that he, he, has, he feels uncomfortable with the label originator of the fursona and he said that after the fandom documentary came out he got a whole flood of messages being like thank you so much for creating personas this is amazing um and and he was he was so nervous about that name that he did his own historical research to see if anybody else had been doing personas before him and he said he couldn't find anything and i said you know i didn't i didn't find anything either in my own research so so within the context of this emerging furry fandom, Ken was Ken was truly doing something that was unprecedented in depicting himself and soon friends as embodied animal selves. I have a quick question. Yeah. Does the the, the artist Ken does he still is he still alive? Mm -hmm. Does he still do still that? doing art? I wonder how much would something like that cost you? That's amazing. Like, Go onto his website. Yeah, still I still opens for commissions every now and then on for affinity too. That's really interesting looking. It's really distinct style that you just don't see the the, yeah. the older eighties and seventies styles of anime. You don't see that anymore. Abs it's absolutely right. And this um so this image. It's kind of cool. Like it, distinct. Exactly, it's distinct. And um, I found it in a place called the Avatar Archive. So I'll get to this word avatar in just a second. But what's kind of interesting is that uh, you'll find a lot of artwork kind of in this style from the late 80s and early 90s. And this Avatar Archive was a was an archive affiliated with Furry Muck, which was a kind of text-based virtual world uh, from the late 80s and early 90s. And the whole purpose of Avatar Archive was for folks to be able to have images of themselves all collected okay. together so you could see what they look like. Uh, it still exists online. If you search Avatar Archive Furry in Google, you'll find it. I think it's avatar.furry.de or something like that. I, I can't remember, but you'll find it. Um, yeah, so there's... This, this kind of gets to Toffee's earlier point about how furry history is really interesting and sometimes tricky because you will find all these archives that haven't been seen for a long time. and You'll have to sort of dig up these sources that you otherwise can't find. And sometimes you have to track down sources that don't exist or exist in only 20 to 40 copies. And many of those are probably gone by now. Uh, but it's it's rather a fun adventure if you if you find the thing you're looking for or something unexpected. So right, furries. 
furries early on, uh, for, I guess personas early on, before the, the concept existed, were really just characters. They were sort of like external characters until Ken came along. So I suppose you could say everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> I should say everything changed when the term avatar came into use. This is the thing that Ken Sample was creating. It was not known as a persona back then. As I say, that term came into use around 1994, maybe a little bit later, because that's just the first mention. So it takes time for a, a term to catch on. But in the late, in the mid to late 80s, the term avatar was a little more common. Wolf Kid in an interview described the avatar as such. The concept was what we think we would look like as our preferred animal which is why most of them are relatively mundane looking and minimally idealized. Their purpose was to allow us to interact as furries in fanfic stories, fan art, drawings, and comics. Uh, so we have this idea of the furry avatar. Um, not a term you hear very often anymore, but it was uh, in common usage at the time. And it's funny how terms change. We were just talking about the history of the word furry. If you ask a furry what furry referred to in the year 1990, they would say furry muck, because furry muck at that time was such a, a big capacious world of furries that most people casually referred to it as furry with a capital F. So what exactly furry means changes, uh, what fursona means changes. So is Wolf, Wolf Kid his real name? Uh, that's a Sona name. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we can also start to find evidence of like this this sort of building and, and increasingly complex idea of the persona in the archival record. So in the, in the fanzine for version, uh, this is number five from, I think, 1987, <coughs> there is a call for the featured furry that includes this language at the end, please, oh, please send me feedback on this idea. The idea being, we want to we wanna show off your furries in our, in our zine, so please send them to us. <coughs> Write down the parameters of your furry. And if you don't have any art, or a photograph of him slash her yourself, then perhaps we can have one done by one of the many artists out there. Um, and what I, what I find fascinating about this language is that yourself in parentheses, where it's the author is, is sort of unsure, is a persona an external character or is a persona you? Uh, it's up to you, you get to decide that for yourself. Uh, but around this time in the late 80s, this, this sort of uh, confusion is entering into the mix. And that leads us to our, our next term. So we started with the term avatar. A little bit later, 1980s, early 90s, we hear a common term, personal furry. Again, this predates the word persona. Uh, Wolf Kid describes it as such. Ken and I have always joked about how boring our avatars are because they're just us. This concept quickly evolved into what people wanted to be, increasingly more idealized and fantastical which is when the term started to evolve into personal furry, because the characters stopped being furry representations of the person's real world physical self. So if we started with avatars, uh, a kind of mundane or a sort of simplified depiction of oneself as an animal, the me but as an animal, then we start moving into more fantastical territory. The personal furry gets to be you, but it's whoever you want to be. You can make your, your Sona whoever you want. You can make your personal, personal furry an idealized version of yourself. That's a really big deal uh, in a lot of different places that furry starts to proliferate. Um, we get to some terminological confusion, which I'll cover in just a second, but I wanted to show you Yippie's personal furry self-portrait from 1989. Um, it's really cool to, to come upon things like this in doing research. Uh, this piece of art, as far as I know, never made it online, but Yippie was like, I drew this uh, in 1989. And I was like, cool, do you mind if I include it in my article? It's like, yeah, sure, go for it. Uh, just credit me. And it, it's really awesome. Um, kind of serendipitous things come out of the archive if you just approach someone and ask. Uh, so one of the things we were trying to do in our project is like reach out, like do a lot of interviews. This article involved interviewing 15 or 16 folks um, who were around in the late 80s and early 90s and were thinking about furry at the time. All right, so then we get to the terminological confusion. So I just showed you a personal furry, yippee, but that personal furry, Yippie describes that personal furry as just me, but in furry form, which is what I defined avatar as, you might remember. Um, 
the terms are not stable, not at all. We have a few different competing ideas and we have a few different terms. So we have around this time avatar and we have personal furry and we have a few different things that those could mean. Me, but as a furry, uh, it could be something like a role-playing avatar. This is a character that I play, but it's sort of me, it's sort of not. And then we have the idealized self, who I, who I want to be, that gets more associated with the personal furry. But the, the problem is that the terms avatar and personal furry aren't stable. So a lot of people use these terms interchangeably or mean very different things. So that gets us to another real uh, historical problem. If you're trying to trace the origin of a concept and the terminology isn't stable, it's going to present a lot of challenges and you have to that means that you have to aggregate a lot more information in order to get a sort of a bigger picture of what the historical record looks like. That historical record looks like a lot of confusion uh, because we have people using avatar and personal furry in a lot of different ways. Um, there's the added confusion too of like, when Robert Hill is suiting as Annabelle Bear in 1987, 1988, um, that's, that's, that's kind of a fursona, but, but also not. Is this a character? I mean, those who are suitors will know that if you put on a fursuit and you start to perform, there's some level of identification that comes with that act. Uh, so whether that counts as a kind of expression of fursona or as a performance really depends on the individual. Um, we also have what I, what I term our little con artists. Um, so Axiom who uh, is a user of furry muck and who I got to interview for a couple articles mentioned people were desperate for visible media. The cons brought people together to exchange and buy artists began to have not so much mailing list circles, but sketchbook circles. They'd go to cons, hold room parties, draw each other's sketchbooks and swapped. Those books exist now as a record of that time and are full of idiosyncratic one-off never seen outside the five people in that room repositories of usually naughty artwork, often of personas. Um, adding another problem to the mix, uh, these are ephemeral materials, things that we will never see again, but we at least have descriptions of the kind of things that were happening when folks were starting to exchange proto-personas. Um, about furry muck, which I mentioned earlier, this kind of big text-based virtual world where you get to create a self and explore around different pre-created worlds uh, or various different locations within the world of furry muck. Axiom told me to swim in text and love its freedom. Well, it's like a drug, that freedom, that ability to be someone else, something else, That's... which I found to be very powerful, <laughs> very powerful language. So for Axiom, Actually, not having to think about artwork and just focus on text is what made it feel so freeing to be on Furry Muck because you can write anything. You can be anything you can imagine if you just put it into words and you don't have to wait four to six years for your fursuit to be finished. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's interesting um, the, way that, the way that the idea of the fursona emerges in all these different media, some purely text-based, some image-based, some proto-internet based like the Usenet. Um, by 1994, the same year that we get the use of the first use that I could find of Persona, we have the unofficial alt.fan.furry FAQ defining personal furry. And apropos of the point that I started with, which is that the definition of these terms gets more and more complex. Grey Wolf begins, definitions range widely, but the common answer seems to be that a personal furry is someone's anthropomorphized animal alter ego. This can mean a number of things. Could be a furry character that the person role plays on furry muck um, that they consider to represent him or herself. Could be an animal that the person's drawn to as when represented in cartoons. It could be a person's totem or favorite animal type. One's attachment to an attitude towards one's personal furry varies greatly. Uh, and I always get stuck on this definitions range widely. It kept, I kept coming across this again and again. And when, <laughs> when I accepted that fact, that's when the article started to come together. You have to accept that the definitions are going to range wildly and, uh, widely and wildly. And that's when you can start to piece together the puzzle that is early furry. Um, 1994, Jim Grote starts advertising, have your portrait in persona, um, and starts creating banners that have the word persona in print. 
Uh, so this is this is like around the time when when Fursona might start to catch hold, though it's it's a question as to when when exactly it sort of has purchase in the community. Because even if you search for Fursona on the still existing archives for alt.fan.fura, you won't see a lot of use of it until like 1996, 1997. Uh, if you want to check out these archives, by the way, they're all recorded on Google Groups. So you just have to go on there and you have access to most, but not all of these uh, early Usenet group archives. Um, so we, we, we finally get to Fursona. And, and of course, the, the question I started with when I was researching this article, like what is the origin of Fursona's? Um, well, the word Fursona ended up being a really small part of this story. So Jim Grote uses it in these advertisements and that might be one way that it catches hold. My, my sort of running theory is that Persona is a perfect pun in a pun-obsessed community at a time when the internet was exploding, just about to explode. And so maybe that's why Persona caught hold and started to replace personal theory. But more research remains to be done on, on that front. Um, just a sort of final quote from Ken. Um, Ken. Ken said to me in the interview, I ask a lot of questions from the subject, meaning whoever whoever I'm drawing a persona of. Mm. I find a lot of the time I ask them questions about aspects they didn't ever think about. I think those situations is the person having to articulate something about themselves that just is. Never thought about because it's background, foundational. If I'm lucky enough to meet the subject or know them, I try to display as much of their personality as possible with the image. It's not just a dog that walks on two legs. It's that person who is a dog that walks on two legs, plays the drums, and loves to watch romantic movies and parties hard with the happiest laugh you've ever seen. Um, artists out there, performers out there, furries out there will understand the sentiment that the more you kind of explore your persona, the more it becomes you, or it might be multiple use, whatever it may be, but that self deepens. Um, that's, that's sort of the fun of it. That's the fun of the exploration. Uh, that's all I want to present on today. If you're interested in the History of Furry Fandom, please do check out our website. It's fangfeatherandfin.com. We have about 15 minutes or so. And in that time, just wanted to kind of pose a, a question to you all, which is what else would you like us, what would you like to see us investigate? Alternatively, if you have questions about what we just presented, we can take those. I just two. have a quick question. Can we go back one more slide for like the. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I should have put the QR code on the next one. Yeah. Um. So, um, I I was a really big fan of the article that was on um Robert Hill and Hilda the Bambuli. Yeah. So like I I think it'd be really cool to see articles on other like early fur suitors. Yep. Some kind of like Kippy Coyote. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Gail's on that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yep. so Gail, the third the third co director of the project is just a font of knowledge about fursuit history and um yeah she she has been doing some really fabulous work on and just stay tuned like this old fursuit is a regular column that she's going to keep we've got um so hilda and then uh walden um yes um and the the werewolves are coming the werewolves are coming yeah yeah, yeah. the werewolves are coming <laughs> stay tuned in october for more werewolves yeah um the history of like con badges that people wear. Ooh, okay. I'm gonna look really rude, but I'm just taking notes on what you say. So thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, because you know that would be interesting to see how you know that developed. I know I use mine as a as a history reference because I get one per con and I try to get them dated. So because I know like my memory's gonna go one day, so I'm like I can look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember going to that. Like I literally have a story connected to each one just because. I, I got a bachelor's degree in history, so I'm, I have a history-oriented mind. I'm like, i got to archive myself in some way. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's a, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, I know some of these don't have the dates on the back here and there, but I got most of them either, you know, and that's and that's how I do it. But I know, and then I'm like, I have so much, you know, I don't want to show them all. But yeah, so, but thinking about it, it's like, when did that start? When did that become a common thing? You know, you understand the reason why people do it, but like, Getting it kicked off would be very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Looking at that. 
Other other questions. Sorry, my arm was falling asleep. Oh, <laughs> I I was actually wondering uh, if you considered sorry. like the Zero different to to get to like you. how many different uh, like for furry species, like which ones are more popular, and like which areas yeah. of the world, and like just um like on a global scale, like being an owl i i see i do see a lot of bird personas but yeah. i i really more so see like mammals and like like dogs and cats yeah. and all that and i and over the years i've seen a lot more like like video game characters and like pokey sonas and things like that and like seeing like how that's the the whole like history behind that and being a content creator like how like personas that you create that like because i've i created like the whole backstory of the lore and world building for my personas and as a content creator like seeing the just worldwide like seeing which species and characters are the most popular and like just that like the the kind of history of that that would be something that would be interesting for me to uh, see yeah and a, a quick plug for another project so fur science is, yeah that's the one yep. i was about to say yeah so fur science international anthropomorphic research project um has been running for about 20 years now 20 plus years um and it's a collaborative group of sociologists anthropologists um uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, who, uh, yeah, they, they, they do a lot of survey work and they've done a lot of tracing about like changes in species, um, distribution. Um, yeah, there's, there's a ton of good stuff that they've done and there's lots more stuff to do with the data, that, like the raw data that they've gathered. They publish it all online for science.org, really easy to find. And they just published their first, um, print book, uh, that is enormous, uh, but also free to download. Uh, so. Dot org, I think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Okay, I already had the most. I guess one question I had in terms of something that we'll, I guess, look at for future things I'm really interested in is, especially seeing some of those early words together, like, you know, people referring to themselves as perverts or saying that the the books are full of naughty sketches, like yeah. the shift towards family friendliness and like accepting of young people and moms. For I'm really interested in when and how that happened, especially you know, like in the early 2000s, like for particularly dirty work online and stuff like that. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm just interested because I think it's a really good thing. There, there's also there's a really fascinating overlap between um, like. Um, there are a bunch of social movements and contemporary um, sort of issues that overlap in interesting ways. We often think today about furry as being an extremely queer subculture, right? Um, and it's really fascinating when you look at early, the earliest furry print material, it is, I mean, all furry is queer, right? But like, it definitely has a heterosexual gaze until 1995 at the earliest. Um, and then like, You'll, you'll have all of these kind of portfolios, um, you know, the Ferversion fanzines, where, like, it's it's all, like, heterosexual, 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 right? And then there'll be, like, one gay thing. Um, and it, it wasn't until um, there's a fanzine called 10% that um, Matt Henry, uh, uh, Mad Badger, put out. Yeah. And he put it out because he was like, I don't see, I'm gay, where's the gay furry stuff? Right, like the idea <laughs> that there isn't gay, gay-oriented furry stuff in the mid '90s is just kind of baffling, um, and it really doesn't like you know the queering, the, the the sort of visible queerness of furry media really doesn't take off until the late '90s, early 2000s. Yeah. Also, I guess you know, sexuality versus just identity. Yeah. You can see how you know something playing Yeah, we, we think so, of the history yeah. rather. Yeah, we, we think about, too, like intra-fandom things like the Burn First movement from the mid to late 90s. And it's like, that's that's true, but it's sort of like an incomplete story. Because, like, we also have to think about 1996, the U.S. federal government's first efforts to pass Internet regulations, which limit the content that can be posted on websites. So it's like a it's sort of a, a tangled problem that is both intra and extra fandom. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'm curious if there's anything kind of in the records of how things shift with the advent of uh, graphical interfaces with these online role-playing communities going from Furry Muck mm -hmm. to, at the earliest, uh, Furcadia. 
Yeah. Yeah. We're I'm working on that. Um, <laughs> I haven't gotten too far past furry muck yet, but, um, yeah. It's amazing that, that, that Furcadia is still around. Yes. It furry muck too. Yeah. You can log on to furry muck, create a character. Uh, it's still running. Um, that's true with tapestries as well. Another really famous muck. Um, that was, it's actually like the, ironically, the, the mucks, despite not having as much usage today, run way better than they used to uh, back in the early days when it was just not like not enough server space to, to run this big world and to uh, admit as many simultaneous users as you wanted. There was usually a cap of like in the tens, like 40 to 50 people. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the transition into virtual worlds that you can see is like a thing I want to write about. It, it, it's, it's, Really wild, just looking at, at, at okay. So we got furry muck, we're just text based. And yeah, then we got for Kadia. Oh, we got 16 bit pixel graphics. Yep. Then, uh, second life, second life, mm -hmm. and then VR chat. Yep. Now. It's just, it, it's yeah, each step of the way, things change notably. It, 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 it just like my casual observations, it almost feels like there is these, these are, these are like almost eras of the community where. Things get a little bit more visible. Things change. You yeah. almost act as tipping points, you know? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I sometimes think of furries online as an itinerant community. We sort of like glom onto a technology and build a world there and then oftentimes uh, pioneer the next big thing and make that look really good, as is happening with VR chat and VR avatars right now. Um, that was some nice furry punning right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta work in more furry puns. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's actually someone that I know that I, I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but he's one of the early furries. There was a there was an M an MP3 that I used to have like 20 years ago that was from NPR that they, they did a report on furry. Really? Okay. And they interviewed him in there. His name is Chip Unicorn. Okay. If you get the chance, get to talk with him. He can probably give you some some insight on the old furries. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. It might be. Do you guys ever like publish a book or anything, or are you going to be more like on the web articles? That's that's a really good question. So we've we've talked about that a little bit. Um, so the short answer is so um, so we're both professional academics, um, and um, publishing books is an enormous pain in the ass, um, and um, it 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 sort of limits access often. Um, and so one thing that we very purposely wanted to do in this project is to make sure that you know this is not. Um, like this is this is part of just the work that we're paid to do by our universities, um, and uh, so like we want everybody to be able to access this as much as possible. You know, we both of us, you know, fundamentally believe that this is important and that furry is core and that like the community's history is is worthy of preservation and worthy of knowing. Right. So. Um, uh, so in general, like we want to keep it as open access as possible, but um, stay tuned for okay. something. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I remember right, Toft is a classics professor, right? I am. Yep. Have you ever found something that's like proto furry band, like pre? -nice Sign up for my class. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I uh, every two years I teach a course called Beast Literature, which is about talking animal and anthropomorphic um, traditions in the ancient Mediterranean world, Western medieval Europe, and in modern contexts. Um, now with real furries. Uh, with, yeah. Now with real furries, um, <laughs> as as seen on Fox News. Um, uh, not in a good way, uh, but um, actually in a, in a perfectly good way. Yeah. Like it's it's almost like a puff piece for me, but. Um, uh, yeah, you know, the, the anthropomorphic impulse is fundamentally a human impulse. And furry is distinct from a lot of the other sort of global anthropomorphic, you know, identifications and performance traditions. Um, but like we have always been doing this, right? The oldest piece of figural art that survives that humans have made is, um, the Lohenmensch. This, uh, it's a, it's an anthropomorphic lion statue that's carved out of, out of mammoth ivory. Um, it's 30, 33,000 years old. Um, you know, so we've always been doing this. Um, uh, yeah. Follow up question to that. Um, because you also mentioned like personas came a little bit late. Mm -hmm. Have you found anybody who 
isn't just making anthropomorphic art, but is representing themselves with an avatar mm. in that way. Yeah, there's a, you know, it happens everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is as old as the Aesopic tradition, right? The idea that, you know, you're using something as code for somebody. Um, uh, but the, um, the, that, like, actually, the pre furry, but a con- really cool contemporary issue is, um, do you remember the name of the two Toledo who told me about this? And it's super cool. Um, there, uh, there's a, a gay artist and a writer from the 60s who wrote love letters back and forth to one another. Oh, do you know? Do you oh my God. Um, uh, very, the, the writer is especially famous, but the, and the, yeah. the artist, the painter is still alive. Um, but they, they wrote these love letters that were just, you know, pen and ink, pen and paper kind of love letters, but they adopted personas mm-hmm. for themselves. Mm-hmm. And they didn't call it mm-hmm. that, but they describe like, you know, one of them is a, is a cat and the other one's mm-hmm. a horse. And they describe in this kind of really loving language, like, oh, I, you know, I want to curl up on you and let you just stroke my fur. And right? it's just this like, you know, and it's, 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 it's 60s American California folks who like they're, they're doing furry stuff, um, you know, and that's that's just most recent kind of iteration. Yeah. Part of what makes the fursona history thorny is like, yeah, there, there are like proto fursonas, but like. Maybe maybe Fursona is contingent on the world of furry existing. So like Ken Sample kind of inaugurates this world where people all of a sudden start making furry versions of themselves and their friends. And that's like around the blossoming of furry fandom itself. So it's like, yeah, Fursona is in a sense predate that, but it sort of would predate the community itself. And so is it a Fursona? Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. It depends on your definition. Will it persona? <laughs> uh, um, you made me think about like the Japanese culture and their, you know, uh, I think it's kimonos. Kimono, yeah, yeah kimono. And like, um, I know there's a lot of in, in, uh, interlapping now, I and mean, I talked to some, you know, Japanese friends. How, you know, it's a, still a different, you know, beast over there that's taken a while to become more welcoming. But perhaps there's like. So it's sort of like a, a side shoot that, you know, that, that combined on its own and developed on its own. That could be a very interesting um, thing. Yeah. But that's the lang- language barrier and also the um, cultural differences would be very much huge because I know there's like um, a privacy thing that comes comes with that. Yeah. Global furry is really fascinating. And Gail has done a really good job of expanding out into global furry cons. Um, I've been working on an article about the history of... Um, uh, exhibits of furry art in non-furry spaces. Um, and actually there are two really cool exhibits that happened in the last couple of years in Mexico. Um, uh, um, Ocelotti Cat is one of the people who helped co-organize it. But um, uh, yeah, like, you know, cultural, it's, it's, we, there are ways in which furry is a sort of distinctly American creation, but there are also so many ways in which furry comes from all of these other different, right? Like it's so f- deeply informed by um, by Japanese culture. It's informed by anime culture. It's informed by sci-fi convention culture um, that, you know, it's already global yeah. uh, by the time furry <laughs> exists. So. We could think about something like TF, which everybody should think about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> TF stories come from around the world for thousands of years. And it's like, that is its own whole river of, furry or like a whatever like it feeds into the river that is furry but it also very much predates furry and it's like it's everywhere tf themes are everywhere um so so yeah like i kind of want to do like a international history of tf and furry sort of a thing at some point too if you got a chance to go to it great and if you didn't don't worry i'm sure that they'll do it again but um bash uh bash pinata in animorphs does a global um tf panel in a lot of conventions and it's great. It just just hundred percent recommend. Go and see it. Um, really cool stuff. Yep. Uh, we have time for one more. Yeah. Related to personas, I was wondering what in the shift came you had from like this is a dog costume to this is a fur suit. Oh. Both in just terminology and when it went from mm-hmm. I'm just I like dressing up as a dog to this is my dog character I dress up. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, it, I think that's fodder for another article, uh, but it's, I would guess it's the late eighties and early nineties. And it probably has to do with the convention scene, um, with early furry cons. Um, 
whether Robert Hill is sort of identifying or not is like an article that I need to write at some point. But um, yeah, the the a, one piece of that puzzle would would be the first suiting live journal, which was actually more of a late nineties, early two two thousands, and through the two thousands thing. But it was basically like a a dedicated blog where folks could go and post their fursuit building techniques. I think that that might play into that history too, but I'm sure, I'm sure the idea of like, I can actually become this character is connected to early conventions. I've seen a lot of, of memes where it's, you know, oh, first fursuit as showed yeah. really extravagant animal costume. Yeah. But obviously they were not fursuits as we know them today. Yeah. It was just a really nice costume for a party or something. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, look, I'll look into that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Robert Hill is a really, really fascinating figure in yeah. er, like the earliest fursuiting. Um, uh, so I, I first found furry through MTV Sex 2K. Anybody? No? Okay, cool. So came out, this is a, there was a series that MTV had running in 2000, 2001 called Sex 2K, which was about alternative sexualities and like wild new stuff. Crazy stuff like bondage. <laughs> um, and they did a cut of a fetish um, documentary and uh, filmmaker and, and photographer Rick Castro was working on a documentary called Plushies and Furries that they did a cut of, um, uh, which has a little bit of Robert Hill stuff. But there was also a, um, a UK HBO cut of it that was a little bit different. Um, so the, the Plushies and Furries that's, that's screened in, in the US focuses on Mike Yote. Um, uh, and it's a coming of age, you know, watching this young guy sort of learn what furry is and sort of come out and experience queerness. It's, it's really like, I mean, at the time it caused a lot of problems, um, and people were very angry about it. But I think in hindsight, if you watch it, like it's, um, it's actually a really beautiful documentary and it's a beautiful you know, sort of encapsulation of experience. But when they did the UK cut, they didn't do the coming of age stuff. They focused on Robert Hill, and there's a ton of great footage in the UK plushies and furries um, that you can still see on YouTube today. And um, interviews with him, um, like really fascinating. Like he's um, he explores, you know, concepts of gender play and transness in a way that like he's not using that vocabulary, but like it's really fascinating. And the, the idea of like the suit as identity and the suit as like a, a being that is you is really cool. And he had uh, 15 of them. Yeah. Something um, like that. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was a performer um, at Disneyland. He was Eeyore primarily. Um, uh, but he, and he learned to make fursuits through that professionally. Um, there's some great interviews where he talks about um, like, he is Eeyore going down on Pigger in the back room of uh, <laughs> the map top stuff. Um, you can find that anecdote in Catherine Gibbs, Catherine Gibson's uh, book, Deviant Desires. Um, uh, it's just, it's got a like four page spread about furries um, and it's, it's, it's quite good. And she's, she's quite a good researcher. Uh, we are, we are out of time. If you want to stick around and ask any more, um, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit, but thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you.